Hello, Donna. Hello, Chris. Hi. It is an absolute pleasure to um, for you to be on the podcast. I know you're very busy, so I really do appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I read an article in The Guardian about a um, group that you um, founded called um, Left Right Hook, which appealed to me because obviously I'm a boxing writer and also just like writing in general. So mm. it appealed to me what you were trying to achieve. And now there's a documentary on your group that you founded. So before we get into more details of that, can you just explain, I've you said your name, but just explain your path up to this point. Yeah, sure. Well, my path is probably uh, a little windy. Um, so I'll kind of dip in and out at different points of, of the journey, if, if that's okay. And feel free to stop me and... Um, get me back on track or ask some questions. Um, But look, I didn't start boxing until I was in my mid thirties, which is, you know, relatively late. Um, And before that I was very much kind of into the arts and I have a um, arts background. So filmmaking, um, some performance um, and a bit of writing. So I guess I'd sort of really separated um, the creative and the physical, the sport, um, which I think is uh, a kind of default that people, you know, they think if they're in the arts that they can't get into sport. You know, it's not necessarily common to have that integrated approach. Mm-hmm. Um, but I came to boxing in my mid-30s because um, I actually started to feel a lot of anger and the anger was coming up, uh, which I knew was directly related to Uh, my abuse history as a survivor of child sexual abuse. And I'd been dealing with that. Well, I'd been dealing with it since I was a child, but actively dealing with it in a recovery way um, only um, at about 32. And really I hit a rock bottom. I got sober. I went into recovery. I had to rebuild my life um, because, you know, my mental health was very, very low. I was very close to probably committing suicide um, and I, um, you know, needed to get help. So I stopped drinking, began to work on the root causes, um, of my, uh, I guess, kind of issues, um, and, um, and deal with, uh, to the best of my ability, um, my, uh, child sexual abuse and the impact that it had had on my life. Um, and then as part of that, a few years into recovery, I felt this anger and that was great, Chris, because, I had spent most of my life in a depression. And so I had numbed my feelings, I disconnected from my feelings. And so feeling this anger was felt really alive and really healthy, but I also knew that I needed to channel it. And so I thought, how can I do that? You know, well, a boxing bag feels like, you know, the best way to kind of process this anger. Um, And, but I didn't just want to box. I didn't just want to hit a bag. I wanted to punch someone. And I wanted to be punched. I wanted to feel like, you know, I wanted to feel what it felt to to be a fighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a few months, I was in an amateur fighting um, kind of journey for about 18 months. Um, And that's a sort of story in and of itself, which which I may touch on today. But just to kind of, with the boxing, that what I discovered quite quickly, and and I'm sure you'll relate to this, is that boxing is actually not about anger. Boxing is actually a form of mindfulness. And so very quickly that anger dissipates because you just gas out. You lose you lose breath, you know, um, and then it becomes about how do you control your breath? How do you control your movements? And so all these things that I was avoiding as a survivor of abuse because I found mindfulness really hard, I found yoga really hard, I found any body-based practice that kind of I was tuning into my body really difficult, almost impossible. But boxing felt like this visceral, engaged, um, embodied way to connect to my body. Um, I didn't, it, that took me a while. I reckon probably even when I was fighting, I'd often dissociate. I'd kind of um, leave my body inside the ring. Not obviously a very healthy uh, response, particularly if you're getting punched in the face. You know, you need to, you actually need to really be on on guard. 
sorry, I kind of went a bit jittery there. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, and yeah, but I, I guess in a sense, boxing was this pursuit for me um, to come into my body. Can you hear me okay, Chris? Sorry, that's... Yeah, yeah, I can hear you okay. Yeah, I can hear you. A little bit jittery. I might just, uh, yeah, should be okay. Um, yeah, it was this safe way, in a sense, for me to come into my body um, in a way that probably I hadn't um, been able to do before. Yeah. I mean, I've written um, about how boxing can help people outside of just two people fighting in general how it's helped people ironically in the troubles in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland all those years ago, how it's helped people like you say, who have not been bullied and have used it as a way of instilling discipline. Um, yeah. It's horrible situations. Now, one of the things I've talked about, it's not just a sport of boxing, but the actual gym environments itself. So yes, you're hitting pads and you're doing, what's your sparring, hitting punch bags, but how was the actual, outside of that, how was the actual gym environment? How did that help you? How did the people help you? How did your coach help you? How did that facilitate that help that you needed? Yeah, look, that's um, the gym I, I began to really fall in love with. And um, I had been to gyms, you know, for probably about 10 years, but never really felt like I kind of, you know, fitted in or, um, embrace the environment in full, but I did did like gyms, um, and then I found this amazing boxing gym, which is kind of where which kickstarted the fighting journey, um, and it was probably a boxing gym or, or a gym that people said, if you don't fit in elsewhere, you come to this gym. You know that was sort of the the ethos behind it. So felt like a bunch of misfits that didn't fit into other gyms that kind of landed into this space. And um, the owner Tommy was just he was a tough man that pushed everyone, but with no judgment. You know, like you were really accepted in his space. He trained people. There were people who were blind training in our gym, and and Tommy would just take them under the wings and just go, mate, you, you you're doing exactly what everyone else is doing. Like I don't care what you're, you know, if you if you if you've got a disability or whatever it is, you know, you you're doing it. And it was um a, just a really accepting space. So in a sense, I brought actively uh, my trauma into this space to a bunch of guys that had no idea how to handle it, uh, no training. Um, and weren't fit or or, or uh, trained to do so. But what they did do was that they accepted me and without judgment. And they pushed me without judgment. And that was really hard because sometimes, you know, I was freezing, like literally I wouldn't punch back. And they're like, punch, you got to punch. Um, and I'm like, I can't, I can't, right? Because it just felt like I was this trapped, probably child. I can't do it, you know? And then and then I'd just leave and I'd burst into tears, you know? And then, and they'd just be like, yeah, whatever. Like, and I, and then I'd come back the next day, you know, because it was like this kind of pursuit to find self. And they helped me um, to the best of their ability do that. And, um I think even though, you know, arguably I probably threw myself into the ring to fight way too soon um, and, and I think I should have waited or done it in a more low stakes environment because as soon as I took it into the competitive space and even though it was amateur um, and I lost and then I lost again and then I lost again, it, that what that did is that it took what was a very empowering sport for me or practice an empowering training environment into a disempowering space because that what that did was the losses um reinforced the the toxic belief systems that I had which were rooted in my childhood you're see you're a loser you're a failure you're worthless what I should have done probably is just been nurtured a little bit more to go into, say, you know, exhibition bouts or really low stake environments where there wasn't win lose. So I was still fighting and still practicing, but not in this competitive way. Um, so, you know, boxing, in a sense, um, had a very um, empowering story for me, but also uh, a, a bit, quite a bit of disempowerment. 
Um, and in the end, I kind of realized, look, I'm not a competitive fighter. It's actually not what I wanted. I didn't even know why I was fighting. I didn't know, but look, I knew why I was fighting or, or the pursuit because it was to try and reconnect with my body. It wasn't to become an, a competitive fighter. Um, I wanted the experience of, of fighting and getting in a ring. Um, and I got that, but I probably didn't need to move it into that competitive space. So, um, but yeah, I think the gym for me, you know, it was just a, um, it was a space and a place where we worked hard. You know, we worked hard, we trained hard, we processed shit without naming it. Um, and we kind of, we became strong together in community. And uh, so I just, I really love gyms. And um, I don't know if I found that place again that I that I had at this gym with Tommy. But um, I, yeah, I have a lot of uh, healthy respect for gyms. And it's funny, Chris, because I work now with um, survivors um, of child sexual abuse and trauma and you know, mostly women, gender diverse survivors who feel really out of place in gyms. They feel like gyms are these kind of oppressive structures, very masculine. They don't feel accepted. They feel judged. And so I feel quite passionate about sort of breaking that down because I think gyms are um, fundamentally, I hope, should be really healthy spaces. They're spaces where we can connect with our bodies and our minds and do it in community. Um, and I believe that at the heart of a gym space, I don't think it always models that for people where they feel like it's a safe and inclusive space um, because they don't necessarily see their bodies represented. Um, they may be traumatised um, and processing um, processing the experience different differently. And then you've got these kind of quite high sensory spaces um, with lots of mirrors and they can be really triggering. Um, so I think gyms have a lot of work to um, hopefully welcome people who come with diverse range of experiences. You know, there's one in three women who have been sexually abused before the age of 18 and one in five guys. So I can tell you there are people coming to gyms that with, with a lot of trauma um, uh, or they're not coming to the gyms and they're avoiding it and then gyms are losing out on helping these people uh, because they're not actually providing spaces that are um, inclusive and welcoming. That surprises me a little bit when you say that, and that's not to denigrate what the women are saying. I, I take it what they say, what yeah. they say is read. But I know from my experiences of when I've been in gyms, because especially coaches, they know that the boxers tend to come from a really bad background. Mm. so therefore when they come into a gym they're just like okay this person unless they say otherwise has come from a particular background here there everyone's the same regardless of where you come from yeah so yeah it, it does that's a bit well, surprising on oh i guess but but also boxing gyms predominantly are very masculine spaces they are you know and so um it's hard it's harder for women in particular to break into those spaces you know um yeah so perhaps that that might be true for for men who feel more you know welcome or embraced in that area but there's a few different hurdles that women in particular because they're not as um you know it's not as many women that that do boxing um yeah is that changing especially the rise of female boxing is that changing in Australia? Yeah, I think we're definitely seeing that and, um, you know, which is really exciting. But, uh, yeah, I guess even still the gym that I go to now because I moved areas um, and, you know, it's still really like probably like, I don't know, less than a quarter uh, are women. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So how did you get from the boxing to the writing? How did you – because I know the two of them have a yeah. history together, boxing and writing – but in terms of how you use the writing, how did that come into your mind to have that idea? Well, I guess at the end of that amateur fighting journey where I'd clocked up a few losses, I eventually won one. Awesome. Yeah. But I didn't feel like I could lay claim to being a champion fighter because I wasn't. 
right? I hadn't won these fights. I didn't have this these medals and this, this story of, of being a champion. Um, but what I did want to do at that point was of my recovery as well is that I really wanted to connect with other survivors. Because, but I didn't just want to teach boxing and I couldn't lay claim to being a champion. So I wondered what could I do that's a little bit different then? And that's when I thought, well, what if we don't just learn boxing or teach boxing? Actually, I do really want to kind of connect with these people and hear their stories. What if we did the first hour where we wrote to a prompt, just generative writing, locating our trauma, locating our experiences, sharing our writing, and then we learn the art of boxing. And we learn the art of boxing as a way to process um, the trauma. You know, we essentially kind of box out the crap that we've written on paper, yeah? Um, and so that's how left right, and then that's W-R-I-T-E, hook, came into kind of being, um, essentially through a spirit of loss um, and um, uh, redefining and reimagining defeat. Um, and you, and also, I think, to integrating um, creativity, writing with the physical body-based, um, you know, uh, sport of boxing. And the research shows, Chris, and and, and really, I, I guess I didn't, I, I did practice first because I'm a I'm a maker, I'm a doer, I'm a filmmaker. So uh, the practice and action came first and then the theory came later because um, I'm also an, an academic. And so the theory is and the research is that trauma is stored in the body. Dealing with it is best done through creativity and body-based practices. What that does is it helps people to regulate their nervous system. And then when they, when they can regulate their nervous system, it means that they can actually go and do deeper work with their therapist. There's also a relational aspect to what we do in Left Right Hook, which is basically we are a community of lived living experience. We are survivors. We come together, not in a therapeutic way, in a kind of democratic peer-based way. We write, we share, we box. And that relational healing is at the heart of what we do because when you're when you've been sexually abused or you've experienced trauma, it disrupts your relationship to yourself. It disrupts your relationship to community and to, to others. Um, and I think hopefully this begins to help to mend some of that pain and to transform it in a sense. So when you started starting, because I'm obviously I imagine with people who have suffered from abuse, yeah hardest part is actually coming forward to a group like this yeah so when you initially started how many people came along and how many people have actually stayed in that group was it a long very long process yeah that's um we we had eight people show up um and i just advertised in my local kind of newspaper and um you know community newspaper and just kind of on facebook and eight people showed up and this was when i ran it in a grassroots way and then half of those people came back to the second workshop. And then what I did was I decided to, because I'm an academic in filmmaking, decided to work with other researchers. And we thought, well, why don't we take it into the research space at the University of Melbourne and we'll do a research project and let's get a psychologist um, and a gender expert and let's measure the program, the eight-week program, and let's see, like, does it actually work? Is it improving people's mental health and well-being? But because I'm a filmmaker, I didn't just want to do psychological research. I wanted to film it. I wanted to say, like, let's make a documentary. Maybe let's even make a book of our writings. And so that's what we did in 2020. So I'd run the project twice in a grassroots way, just at my local boxing gym. It was very intense. It was very emotional. It was palpable. It was scary, but it was also really transformative. And so I knew there was something really special in this work. In 2020, we took it into the research space. We measured the program. There was a reduction in PTSD, a reduction in stress and depression, and an increase in personal agency, belonging, and resilience. Amazing, right? 
Now, this is 2020. Two weeks into filming, what, what do you think happened? Bloody COVID, yeah? Who had to go online, right? So six of those eight weeks were online, people shadow boxing in their lounge rooms, you know, uh, punching pillows, but we still got those results, which is incredible. We I ran that project three times over 2020 with the same group of participants, and we amassed an incredible body of writings, um, and we uh, co-curated a book of our writings which is Left Right Hook Survivor Stories from a Creative Arts Boxing and Writing Project. Um, and you can get that online. Um, and, then in, and then from 2021, we started filming again with the participants. Um, and that's how we made the documentary film. And we did, so that documentary film was meant to be an eight week kind of, let's film a boxing and writing workshop. It turned into a three year journey. In, in overall, it's been a four year filming journey, which is incredible. Um, and then we just released the film. It had its world premiere at the Melbourne International Film Festival. I mean, that's incredible. When, when yeah. did you actually start? What year did you start Left Right Hook? Well, I started it independently in 2019. And so I've been really doing this project for five years. And then 2020 was kind of when we officialised it in the research space. And then in 2022, at the end of that, I founded a charity which is called Left Right Hook, and that is a survivor-led charity, and that's where we run riding and boxing programs for survivors. We train up trainers who have lived living experience, and we roll out programs in the community. And we're a small charity at the moment because we're only 18 months into the journey, um, but the film is really, like we knew when the film went out there to the market that people would see the film and they'd be like, I want to do that program. And so I've been kind of trying to scale the program and grow the program so that essentially we can meet the demand. And, you know, from the film, we've got just under 100 people wanting to do the program at the moment. We don't have 100 programs or, or 10 programs to run, I can tell you that, because they cost money and time and all of that. But what that demonstrates is that there is a demand and hopefully as we seek further funding, et cetera, um, we can, um, yeah, we can roll out more programs. Regarding the film, because I said earlier, it's one thing to tell it in front of a small group, mm. but to actually put it on film and then that film yeah. be made and go to bed, that must have been terrifying. So I imagine the participants had some flexibility in terms of whether it wants to be shown in a film or not and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, we really adopted a kind of a trauma-informed approach. And so, you know, there's a tension with that, of course, right? And we were really explicit with the participants. It's an opt-in, opt-out. You can remove yourself at any point, but there will come a time when you cannot remove yourself. Yeah. Because, you know, you we've sold it to a distributor or, you know, we've got to lock it off from a funding perspective. Um, so... At, but I guess in a sense, because we started out with the intention and every, and we were very clear, we're bringing a camera into the space, we're testing this idea, we're seeing if it works, it's observational, um, it's not married, at, uh, I don't know what your UK, or it's not a reality show, right? It, um, Love Island or whatever, it's not, it's not like that. It's an it's a observational documentary. It's, it's an ethical approach to bearing witness to the experience and your story and the process. And I think we accurately very much bore witness to the process that we underwent and really honoured and respected the stories. And people had a lot of agency and a lot of choice um, throughout the whole filming process. We talked to them at each point about what we were thinking next for the filming. Oh, we're thinking about this. What do you think? You know, is that something you want to do? And we test ideas and worked in collaboration with the participants. Um, but, of course, film fixes you in a time and that's an uncomfortable experience, right? because we change and we grow. And so even for myself, seeing myself on screen is so cringeworthy um, and it's really hard. Um, but I also appreciate that the film is bigger than me. It's bigger than the participants because essentially we are a kind of vehicle for a, for a greater examination of a 
of a really uh, um, important social issue. Um, and I think we uh, very bravely, all of us, um, share the the impact and effects of what it means to kind of live with trauma um, and to be and to be functioning with trauma, to be just going through the world with the with the long term effects of trauma. And I think that is helpful for people to see because we don't often see that. Um, and I think it helps people understand, have compassion and empathy, and hopefully, I I hope be able to see themselves and see a see a sense of hope. Um, and I guess a, a a desire to heal, actually, and to recover. With the writing, and obviously, I know yeah. you said you've done a, a book on it, um, which I'll leave a link on the description below and the YouTube and Spotify. But how can I put this? When they talk about it, is it just when you say it's creative? Does it start off with them talking about their abuse, and then it just develops into whatever they want to talk about, or how does it work in that sense? Yeah, I mean, it, I guess because so what happens is we set a timer, we set a timer for about, say, 10 minutes, right, could be five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and, every, and you're given a prompt. So the prompt could be my body, shame. Um, I looked behind and dot, 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 you know, so it could be anything, right. And you, you're, you're encouraged to write nonstop. So you don't necessarily have, um, oh, I'm going to write about my trauma at the age of three or whatever, right? Because you don't know what's going to come up. It's all, it's completely kind of imaginative and really from kind of the depths within. And so sometimes people would, yeah, absolutely write about their trauma. Other times they might skirt around the edges. Other times they might write about an adult experience, like it, you just don't know. And so the book have, has a real range of experiences. I think mostly the book um, and the film as well doesn't necessarily go into the experiences of people's trauma, right? Oh, at, at this point he did this, that, that, right? It doesn't really talk about that. It actually talks about the effects of the trauma. It talks about the deep um, feelings, the buried feelings, the thoughts and the beliefs um, that ultimately I think are, are rooted in shame and disempowerment because trauma leaves you feeling powerless. And I think the the book and, and the film um, shares that. I think it talks about the idea of fragmented memories, um, disconnection of self, disconnection of bodies and mind, um, yeah, and the and I think the fracture in in relation in relationships. Interesting, you just said there about relationships. You talked about research earlier. Yeah. Was there any research in terms of how people who go through your program developed in terms of relationships and what they think about them? Yeah, well, the research definitely has demonstrated um, that there was a greater sense of belonging connection and meaning making and we have continued to work with researchers at the University of Melbourne um, to research our, our um, programs so we've done another five I think five programs with that we've researched with 30 participants and um, it continues to demonstrate the same results which is amazing so I do believe um, yeah I do believe that it chips away at um, helping people um make meaning of their experiences but also um yeah experience a sense of belonging um in community when you when the film was premiered at the Melbourne International Festival I imagine yourself and some of us went so long mm -hmm. what was that whole experience like especially for something so personal to you all uh it was massive because we had our world premiere and so what happened was that um, there's a fashion label called Dacuba in um, Australia. Don't, I don't think they're international, but um, they have a foundation, which is a philanthropic arm, and they sponsored our world premiere. So we had a premiere with purpose. And so they dressed us. 
we had a black carpet instead of a red carpet because it was kind of a signature look. Um, and there was celebrity there, you know, like it was huge, Chris, right? And so for a bunch of just average um, survivors and particularly people who had literally lived an existence rooted in shame to all of a sudden kind of be on the, the, the black carpet and photos and, you know, all the rest and all this publicity, um, it was truly amazing. And people who were there to, to to listen and to hear and to validate their stories on screen. It was a hard film. I, I we, we watched the film. I found that uncomfortable. I'd seen the film before, um, but I think that kind of played with my head a little bit. Um, that's another story. But after that, after the screening, we came up on stage and we had a QA. and a um, and that was amazing and it was so well received. We had three standing ovations throughout the entire festival. Um, we won the Audience Award at the Melbourne International Film Festival. Like it's absolutely incredible, you know, for this film that's rooted in, well, an issue, sorry, that's rooted in shame and secrecy and disgust and all these things that people don't want to talk about, for it to have this light shone on it um, and be received so gracefully and impactfully if that's a word um then you know it, it's just been incredible they may not have necessarily joined a program but since the film has, has been released um although i think it's main releases next month i believe in october is that correct yeah so we go into cinemas in australia um and then um fingers crossed you know we we want to go international because you know but that requires its own distribution strategy so stay tuned for that one okay cool i imagine even from the festival did you get people come up to you and say actually i even if they won't abuse themselves but i know someone else abused i didn't understand them and then your film made me understand them have you had those sorts of experiences yeah, all the time. And, um, yeah, we've got some really good resources on our website, which is leftrighthook.film. There's also leftrighthook.org, which is the charity one. But the film has some great resources to assist people if um, they watch the film and they're like, oh, my God, that's happened to me, or I know someone that this has happened to and, and how to best support them. So I think absolutely the film does, like it is triggering. It does bring up stuff for people. Um, but I think there is a message of hope and healing in the film and, um, I, I, that's what we, where we need to probably focus our energies on. Okay. And mm. just listening to you and what you're saying, your own personal journey and what the women have been through is just incredible. Like, I don't know anyone who can cover it so really much uh, power to you in regards to that in regards to your charity organization how would you like it to develop over the next two three years yeah so look I mean it's a question of growing um and doing that in a really authentic um and empowering way because you know at the end of the day we are working with people who have been abused and so you know you can't just kind of rush it out there um, it needs to, you need to have the right trainers to make sure that people are really held in that space. So over the next two years, we um, have partnered with the University of Melbourne to run a randomised controlled trial. And so what that means is that um, we are comparing boxing only to the left right hook program, which is writing and boxing. And we're comparing the effects like, because we know that boxing, and you, you would know this, is really good, yeah? It's really good for your mental health, your physical health, right? It actually has proven therapeutic benefits. What we want to look at is how does the combination of writing and boxing better, in a sense, better that? Mm -hmm. Is it is it better, yeah? Um, so that's what we're doing over the next two years. We've got a focus of that. Um, so we're looking for survivors just in Melbourne, Australia, um, to get involved with that. Um and then alongside that, we're running community programs um, where we're training up trainers. Um, and then the idea is really to go national and then be able to go international once we get those research results, because that will give us the evidence base that you need to cut through internationally. Um, so, you know, it's a big vision, Chris, and it's also like a, it's a life vision, yeah? Like I feel that I started the program 
in a little grassroots way at my local boxing gym. I didn't, I kind of thought, uh, I'm just going to give this a go. Um, and then it's kind of grown into this really sort of massive um, undertaking and essentially transformed my life and also given me great purpose and meaning. Although this isn't the purpose of your program of a, and you use writing as a way of uh, therapy, have any of the women that have participated in that actually discovered we have a real, they have a real talent for writing and gone on to further develop their writing in other ways? Um, I'm not sure whether people have gone on to fully develop it, um, but we we have a range of people coming into the room. We have people who are writers coming in to do the workshop. Um, and then we've got people that are kind of just discovering their voice. Um, I think what happens is that the quality of the writing is so authentic and raw in the space. It is incredible. It's really powerful. Um, and so, yes, I do think that people 100% um, uh, go on to develop their practice. And I, actually, there, there is one woman who um, has just written a, a journal article, actually, about Left Right Hook um and her own experiences and she was like a 70 year old woman who came into our program um never boxed in her life never done any exercise but was a writer and uh so now she's kind of writing about what it means to combine writing with boxing which is really beautiful so we see lots of different growth um and um things emerge from people in the space as i said earlier with boxing, I've written about this as well, how it's helped people, like I said, from political like, troubles in Northern Ireland and escape yeah. gangs and whatnot. So I know I've said it before, I keep saying it, what you're doing and the women involved is just incredible. And I really all power to you all. Um, just quickly, finally, if people want to find out work of things, one way they can find more information on Left Right Hook. Yeah. And also, is there a way that they can contribute to any funding at all of your um, organisation to help more women? Yeah, love the questions. Um, so, well, actually, the first thing I want to say is that we, another thing that we're doing is we're going to um, run programs for male survivors. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to call that out because, um, you know, at the moment, obviously, me being a woman, like I've been focused on women, right, um, and gender diverse survivors. Um, but we uh, have a couple of male survivors who are training up to run male programs so watch this space um but yeah i'd love people to like definitely if you come and stay connected to the film which is leftrighthook.film come and stay connected to the organization which is the charity which is leftrighthook.org there's a donate button in the charity 100 percent. like a charity is about needs community support it just does we uh you know applying for lots of grants we've got philanthropy but we also really need the community to stand behind us um and so if you feel called um any donation large or small helps us um it helps us just chip away at various things from better supporting the participants through the program sponsoring places so that um it's accessible um because we try to charge at a very low cost for people to do the program, those that can afford it, we've got a little benchmark price. Those that can't, just pay what you want. Um, so, yeah, any donation, big or small, helps us. And there's a donate button on the charity website. I know it's been a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast and really all the best for your organisation and charity. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure talking to you from the UK. Uh, well, I'm in Australia and... Um, yeah, hope to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.